announcing the arrival of Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, and Yang Berbahagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasmah Mohamad Ali, accompanied by Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mabuk, member of the board ISIS Malaysia, His Excellency Mr. Takahashi Katsuhiko, Ambassador of Japan to Malaysia, and distinguished guests. Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia. Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasma Muhammad Ali. Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mabuk, Chairman of MAIDA and Board Member of ISIS Malaysia. His Excellency Mr. Takahashi Katsuhiko, Ambassador of Japan to Malaysia. Mr. Nishida Shigenobu, Auditor and Representative for Japan Malaysia Association. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat datang and a warm welcome to the 40 years of Look East Policy 1982-2022 book launch and the Malaysia-Japan Forum. To begin this morning's session, may I please have the honour of inviting Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub to deliver the welcoming remarks. Yang Amat Bahagia, Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Yang Amat Bahagia, Tun Dr. Siti Asma Ali, Your Excellency, Mr. Takahashi Katsuhiko, Mr. Nishida Shigenobu, and I also want to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, the author of the book, the, namely Ms. Madam Akiko Kato, the author of the book, 40 Years of uh, Louis Policy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Salam Kuala Warakatu, Salam Sejahtera, Salamat Pagi. I'm delivering this welcoming remark to on behalf of Tan Sri Dr. Munir Majid, uh, the Chairman of IC, Board of ICS, who sends his apologies to Tun and, 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 and also the distinguished guests and Edition. He's not able to be here because he's in, in Europe for a function that you can afford to avoid. It gives me, this is his speech, I'm going to read his speech soon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to this event commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Look East policy and the 65th anniversary of Malaysia-Japan diplomatic relations. This event is the result of a multi-stakeholder collaboration between ISIS Malaysia, the Japan Malaysia Association, JMA, and the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. I would like to congratulate the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia and its Malaysian counterpart for the event, the Ministry of International Trade Industry of Miti Malaysia, for successfully organizing a series of year-long events to mark the moment, this momentous celebration. When the Japan Malaysia Association approached us almost a year ago to host a series of discussions surrounding Look East policy, we are, of course, did not hesitate to do this. The policy was instrumental in the instrumental in, in for the historical economic development of Malaysia and Japan, of course, played a major role as a model for Malaysia's development. Eventually, ISIS Malaysia has collaborated with the Embassy on three events. The first two were webinars, a discussion on Japan's society 5.0 on 28th March 2022, and an examination of the Look East policy on 18th May 2022. This culminated in the third collaboration, which is our event today, with the theme of the past, present, and future. It comprises a book launch and a forum on Malaysia-Japan relations. The book, titled 40 Years of the Look East Policy, 1982-2022, was authored by Madam Akiko Kato and by the Japan Malaysia Association. It will be officially launched sh shortly by Yang Amat Bahagia, Yang Amat Bahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate, congratulate Madam Akiko Kato for all her hard work and determination in throughout the research and writing processes, especially when it comes to the encapsulating the extensive elements of his policy. The second half of the event is a forum on Malaysia-Japan relations. It will focus 
of the changing regional landscape and aims to look both the de at developments and the future directions of the bilateral relationship with Malaysia and Japan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as a younger man then, when the Louis policy was first announced by the architect, our Tun Dr. Ismail then, our Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, Yang Amat, Yang Amat Bahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, I felt both excitement and trepidation in equal measures. He presented a seminal change for the country. Malaysia, which had for decades looked towards the West as a model of development. The shift in orientation, however, would not be easy, but for decades down the road, no one can deny the significant and fundamentally positive impact that the Louis policy, and indeed Japan, has played in Malaysia's national and international economic development. Our shared strategic interests, values on democracy, the rule of law, international trade, and a stable and secure maritime domain have brought us to closer. The task before us is to rediscover and rejuvenate past connections, strengthen the, the current, the, the, strengthen the current currencies and, and chart a path toward the future. Undeniably, the substance that contributed to the cordial friendly relations between Malaysia and Japan are economic relations, cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. Ladies and gentlemen, I am anticipating the, a fruitful discourse layered with sick insights given by the speakers to be helpful in giving us some ideas on the current government policies, future directions of the Luke East policy, societal issues, and the impact of major power competition on the Malaysia-Japan relationship. In closing, I want to express my deep appreciation for the hard work invested by both ISIS Malaysia and Japan Malaysia Association in organizing this meaningful event. I would also like to express my appreciation once again to the Japanese Embassy in Malaysia and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan for the assistance throughout the endeavor. My appreciation so goes to Yang Ahmad Bahagia, to Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, Yang Ahmad Bahagia, to Dr. Siti Hasma for gracing us today, and I wish you both the best of health. We sincerely hope that this event will serve as a springboard for future collaboration between the both, both in both sides. Thank you. Terima kasih. Domo arigato gozaimasu with gambari masu. Thank you. So, Tun, Tun Sama, Ambassador, that's the speech of the, of the chairman. I've read it. I, on my personal behalf, thank you. It's nice to see you, Tun. Tun was my boss, was former boss during the crisis, financial crisis days. It was very interesting in 1998. So, thank you very much, Tun, and thank you everybody for coming, for gracing this event. I'm looking forward to a good exchange of views after this. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yang Babahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mabuk, for your remarks. With great pleasure, may I please invite His Excellency Mr. Takahashi Katsuhiko, Ambassador of Japan to Malaysia, to deliver his remarks. Yang Ahmad Babahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia. Yang Ahmad Babahagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasma Ali. Yang Babahagia Tansuri Dr. Suleiman Mahbub, Chairman of MAIDA and Board Member of ISIS Malaysia, Mr. Nishida Shigenobu, Auditor and Representative for Japan Malaysia Association, Ms. Kato Akiko, Executive Director, Japan Future Leaders School, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to ISIS Malaysia for hosting this event. ISIS and our embassy have constant collaboration. Just one week ago, ISIS hosted a lecture by a Japanese scholar in cooperation with our embassy. In May this year, ISIS organized a webinar featuring the 40th anniversary of the Request of Policy or LEP. 
My gratitude also goes to Japan Malaysia Association or JMA. The association has been long dedicating itself to promoting the Japan Malaysia relations. It is remarkable that JMA has been planting trees in Sarawak since 1995. The number of planted indigenous species has now exceeded three quarter million trees. Thanks to their hard work, approximately 5,800 hectares of the planted forest have been designated as National Park of Sarawak. Of course, I also thank JMA and Ms. Kato for highlighting the request policy by publishing a book that elaborates the history of the policy. And I would also like to thank Tun Dr. Mahathir, a longtime friend of Japan, for his presence here today with Madame. It is meaningful that Tun's testimony about the Rukwista policy is recorded in Ms. Kato's book, which is featured in this event. Ladies and gentlemen, since the beginning of this year, our embassy has approved almost 180 events to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Rukwista policy. I have attended many of them and I have discussed the policy with various figures on various occasions. Those experiences always made me realize how significant the Rukwista policy has been for the japan Malaysia relations. They repeat the policy of the Malaysian government, but it can be called a joint project of the two countries as well. Under the policy, more than 26,000 young and hopeful Malaysians have studied or received training in Japan. I think some of the participants also here today is under this program. They are taking full advantage of the experiences and achieving success in a wide range of fields. You can find specific stories in Ms. Kato's book. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the end of the year 2022, and I believe the 40th anniversary has given us a great opportunity to discuss how the LEP should be developed, looking ahead to the future. While the Japan-Malaysia relationship has become even more solid through a series of the anniversary events this year, the world has changed dramatically in the past 40 years. Considering the changes, I believe that we should expand the scope of the request policy to non-traditional areas of cooperation, such as aging society, digital economy, and disaster risk reduction. At the same time, Japan can learn from Malaysia's expertise in the area of Islamic finance and halal industry, as well as its experience how to keep a diverse society with stability and prosperity. These attempts will develop the LEP into a deeper and multifaceted collaboration and the bilateral relations will enjoy a mutual benefit and play a role more relevant to the world today. Actually, these points that I just described are in line with what the Malaysian government expects to implement as potential cooperation under the request policy. In August this year, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, hosted a business seminar to commemorate the Lucrista policy 40th anniversary, and on that occasion, then Prime Minister Ismail Sabri named some new fields of cooperation, which overlapped with my proposed area to a large extent. I hope that the new Malaysian government continue to put importance on co cooperation under the Lucrista policy, and that we can celebrate the 50th anniversary with fruitful achievement. To change the point of view, the world is now facing an increasing number of challenges. Let alone the situation in Ukraine, we see issues and complications 
such as North Korea, Taiwan, the East and South China Seas, and Myanmar, to name a few. In the world today, it is more important for countries that share the value of rule of law to collaborate in defending the rule-based world order. In this backdrop, maintaining a strong and cordial relationship between Japan and Malaysia will not only benefit the peoples of the two countries, but also lead to peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region, in particular in ASEAN countries. ASEAN and Japan agreed to designate next year, the year 2023, as the 50th year of ASEAN-Japan friendship and cooperation. And Japan will be hosting a commemorative summit in Tokyo toward the end of next year. I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing my expectation that the book launched today will remind the audience of the magnitude and relevance of the Lucristo policy and that the forum part will contribute to revitalization of the LEP toward the next 40 years. Thank you very much. Terimakashi and arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you, Your Excellency, for the remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I now please have the honour of inviting young Ahmad Babahagia, Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, accompanied by young Babahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub and Alizan Mahadi to deliver the keynote address. Young Babahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub, Chairman of MIDA and Board Member of ISIS Malaysia, His Excellency Mr. Takahashi Katsuhiko, Ambassador of Japan to Malaysia, Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at the 40, year, 40 years anniversary of the Look East policy, 1982-2022, book launch, and the Malaysia-Japan Forum. It is indeed an honor. Before I proceed further, I would like to share a very recent anecdote which to my mind is the embodiment of my decision some 40 years ago to introduce the Look East policy. Two nights ago, Japan, nicknamed the Samurai Blue, lost to Croatia on penalties which effectively denied it a place in the quarterfinals of the ongoing World Cup in Qatar. It would have been a truly devastating loss for the hordes of Japanese fans who had traveled to Qatar, and especially after witnessing their team beat the likes of pedigreed Germany and Spain in the group stage. Not being much of a football fan, my story today is not about Japan's prowess in the tournament, but rather on reports of how Japanese fans stayed behind at the stadium after the team's defeat and continued with their practice of collecting rubbish and help clean up the place. To my mind, it would have been easy to discard the practice which had made Japanese fans admire the world over after facing such a painful defeat. But their discipline, discipline, ethics, pride and honour did not allow them to succumb to the personal grief for or sadness and remain steadfast to their value system. I know I run the risk of being accused of overpraising the Japanese by saying all this. 
Of course, the Japanese are not devoid of human feelings as other races from whichever part of the world. But their work ethics, discipline, pride and sense of shame when failing are some of the values that I wanted to be embraced by Malaysians when the Look East policy was formulated and introduced. Ladies and gentlemen, when I introduced the Look East policy as part of our national policy in December 1981, I was only in the fifth month of my prime ministership. But the seeds of the policy had already started growing in me some 20 years earlier. In 1961, when I visited Japan for the first time with my wife, I saw the ongoing construction of the Metropolitan Expressway in the city of Tokyo in preparation for the Olympics. What was amazing was the rate of development that Japan was experiencing. And it occurred not too long after Japan had suffered massive devastation from war. I've said this before, and I will say it again. I concluded that the recovery of Japan is very much attributed to the Japanese culture and values, their discipline, hard-working attitude, and commitment to responsibility, and most of all, their deep sense of shame if they fail in their duty. In the Japan of today, the deep sense of shame is still an integral part of the Japanese way of life. Another story regarding shame and honor that is worth repeating is how Japanese railway staff would perform a mass apology ceremony to East passengers if the train is late even by a few minutes. When I became the Prime Minister, I believe that if Malaysians have the same attitude, ethics, and work culture, alongside the sense of pride in their work and sense of shame when failing, we would be as successful as the Japanese. It was, however, not an easy task as Malaysia, like any other former colonies of the European nations, tended to be more accustomed to being, to treating the Western culture as superior. Though it was not easy to supplant the culture of the former colonialists, we have managed to some degree to successfully promote the policy. Our students and workforce sent to Japan upon their, sent to Japan upon their return were testimony of this success and that the work ethics they adopted were worthy to be emulated by fellow Malaysians. Of course, the policy would not have been successful without the support and cooperation of the Japanese government. The Lukis policy has been one of the cornerstones of Malaysia's Malaysia-Japan relations. Throughout the years, Japan had assisted Malaysia tremendously in its economic development endeavors. Japan helped Malaysia build many of its world-class infrastructure, transfer technology, technical knowledge, and extended a helping hand during the financial crisis of 1997 and recent pandemic. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is now four decades since the policy was introduced, and I believe it is still a good and relevant policy for Malaysia and for Malaysians. After I stepped down in 2003, during my first stint as the Prime Minister, subsequent Malaysian governments after me continued to support the policy, though the emphasis was not as strong. During my second stint as Prime Minister, I was focused on the revitalization of the policy. 
the late Prime Minister Abe Shinzo and I had then agreed that the framework for the Look East Policy 2.0 must incorporate new trends in bilateral cooperation in order to remain relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, new global developments in particular, the meteoric rise of China, both as economic and military power, and the hostile reaction to this by the United States had impacted many of our foreign policies and international relations. ASEAN faces a threat to its centrality and subsequently its relevancy from both external and internal forces. Malaysia and Japan perceive the threats from these new realities differently. China's rise caused greater concern in Japan, leading it to align itself closer to the United States. Meanwhile, China's growing prominence within the Southeast, Southeast Asian region to overshadow Japan's presence. Rather than integration and cooperation, the region is increasingly being divisive, pushed to choose sides. It is important for Malaysia and Japan not to lose sight of its long-standing good relations. Albeit, despite these new challenge, challenges and uncertainties, I personally and sincerely hope and sincere and that the people-to-people -people interaction between the Malaysians and Japanese people would blossom and into a strong and enduring bond and that it will be the glue that bind our two nations together. Before I end my speech, I wish to thank ISIS Malaysia, the Japan-Malaysia Association, the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan for inviting me. I truly hope the Look East policy will continue for many year, more years and act as a balance to other cultures, particularly those from the West. It is also my fervent hope that the 40th anniversary of the Look East policy marks the dawn of a new era of Malaysia-Japan relations. I thank you. Thank you, Yang Ahmad Babahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad for delivering the keynote address. Without further ado, can I please invite Yang Babahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub to moderate the question and answer session. Yang Babahagia Tan Sri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tun, it was a wonderful speech. Really wonderful speech. Uh, you know, um, I remember those days when I think you were the first leader who sent many students to East Asia. Literally, and uh, one for the graduates of <laughs> our ISIS uh, director of research, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard um, Dr. Mahadeo uh, giving the background of the Look East policy. Indeed, Look East policy has benefited uh, many Malaysians, particularly the students and the uh, workers. Students are getting knowledge from the perspective of Japan and the East uh, Malaysia Tun. And in terms of workers, I'm from Maida, so I remember the worker got a lot uh, skill uh, acquisition from uh, South Korea and Japan in particular. So we benefited a lot, not to mention in terms of quantity investments, quality investment, and also in terms of trade. To, to something over and above your concern of work ethics, concern of uh, discipline. But the, the real economy benefited a lot in terms of investment, in terms of technologies. So I don't want to speak much. You should take advantage of the presence of Yamba Ahmad Bhagyatun. Let me invite uh, members of the floor who would like to raise some questions, uh, get some further clarification from Yamba Bhagyatun. Let me, let me invite anyone. Yes, your name please, and maybe a short, don't have a long question. And Your name please, and then your question. Thank you. 
Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Vikar Ahmed bin Muhammad. Uh, my question is uh, yang bagi uh, I believe that uh, these East Look policy when you started 40 years ago, that time I was uh, one years old. That time I was one years old. My mom and my dad used to talk to me that you have started this policy. Your policy when East Look policy was a very successful policy. But when we see there's a change in the government's uh, Previously, there's a three governments has came, and what do you think that the current government will continue this legacy of this policy, and which will benefit the Malaysian people through this bilateral relation between Malaysia and Japan? And what are the new model that will be introduced into this policy to make this policy more strengthened and be more vulnerable to the people? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. But subsequent prime ministers of Malaysia uh, who followed me, they all said that they will continue with the policy. But of course, things have changed. Today, business, doing business is not the same as it was 40 years ago. Today, we have new technologies, we have better com communication, we have better ways of communicating with other without even meeting each other. We can do that on the, on the line. And many of the businesses are carried out not in the usual way of going to a place to buy things, but merely by making the order online and the things will be delivered to your home, which means that the shops are no longer needed. So this is a new way of doing business. And it has been shown that this new way has expanded business to such an extent that in one minute, one million deals can be carried out. Uh, this is what we are seeing today. So both Malaysia and Japan must adopt this new system and develop new relations between the companies in Japan and the companies in Malaysia. But to do this, we need government support. If the government is very uh, aggressive and positive about relations between Malaysia and Japan, I'm quite sure that Malaysia and Japan will benefit even more from the look East policy than before. I thank you. Thank you. Yes, second question, please. I hope you can take off the mask because the sound is not very clear. Thank you. Your name, please. Stephen Leong, uh, ISIS Visiting Fellow. Young uh, Ahmad Rohamad, the Mahathir. This is the 40th. This is not very clear, Steve. This is the 40th. Can you hear me? Yeah, no. This is the 40th. 40th anniversary, and I have a program here for the 30th anniversary of Look East policy. And we have proceeded 10 years later, okay? I would like to add a different perspective on this Look East policy, because my own uh, relationship being at ISIS as director of the Center for Japan Studies, sponsored and financed by the Japanese companies under umbrella Keidan Run, we moved very much forward to promote uh, Look East policy. And part of the program was this, that while we have a bilateral relationship. I would like to propose that we publicize it and to see how Japan and Malaysia can work together to reach out to third countries. i give you an example. In the year 2003, I was invited as Center for Japan Studies Director by uh, Jetro uh, Representative 
in Uzbekistan to go to Tashkent and to talk about uh, Look East policy. And I was supported very strongly by our embassy there. And so I went. It was a very good opportunity for me because I get to visit uh, cities like Bukhara and Samarkand and so on. Okay? So I explained the Look East policy to them. And they liked it so much so that the following year, 2004, they invited us again to go there, this time with Panasonic uh, Company to talk about Look East policy. So they appreciate it very much, you know. So I'd like for this to, to continue because then we can see how we can collaborate and help another country. I remember in Tashkent, that was the first time I, I tasted uh, horse meat. <laughs> and I found that I could walk faster after that. <laughs> you see? Thank you. Steve, so, you got short question. Yes. So thank you so much. Appreciate very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the question is whether our model uh, look, is possible, can be, uh, you know, can be disseminated elsewhere, especially in the world country. We have the presence of the United Nations today. Uh, maybe one, you know, Yusha? Uh, she stayed back to, to listen to this discussion, I think. <laughs> so, Tun, uh, uh, this looks policy as a model for cooperation uh, for other country, developing countries, too. Do you have views on this? Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with you that we should not confine the look East policy to Malaysia alone. It has benefited Malaysia and it can benefit many other countries. The mo most important thing about the Look East policy is not the investment. It is about the culture, the culture and the value system of the Japanese, which accounts for their success. I believe that the culture of the people is what distinguish people, not the color of the skin, not the location, not the geographical background, but the culture. If the culture is right, they succeed. If the culture is wrong, they fail. So the Japanese culture appears to have given Japan the, the kind of uh, push that has enabled Japan very early to emulate uh, the uh, Western countries and their system and to benefit from that. So Japan looked West initially. But then Japan developed its own culture, which is far better than the Western culture. And we, having distinguished between Eastern and Western cultures, feel that the Eastern cultures has certain uh, advantages, certain factors which uh, enable Eastern countries to not only catch up with the West, but also exceed the performance of the West. So if we can spread elements of the Japanese culture, in particular the sense of shame, I think many countries will benefit. Today we find that people have lost the sense of shame, unfortunately even in Malaysia, where you can do anything that is criminal even but people do not uh, feel a sense of shame. We find in Malaysia today a lack of sense of shame to the extent that we are willing to kiss the hands of criminals. So that is going to destroy the development of this country because I believe that it is the culture of the people not the color of the skin or the background, other backgrounds, but the culture. If it includes a sense of shame, Malaysia will be able to recover, and so will other countries if they adopt this uh, special value system of the Japanese. Thank you. Thank you, Tun. Tun has, uh, has uh, and, uh, what you call emphasized importance of culture, value system, work ethics, that sort of thing. We have been very consistent here, but you're running out. <laughs> yes, Usha. Usha is from United Nations, Tun. 
Uh, 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 she's from UNDP, eh? under Secretary. No, for... I, no, no, no. I used to yeah. uh, serve uh, okay. in various okay. capacities. Honorable Tun, it is as always a great joy and honor to uh, listen to you. And I totally agree with you on the value system, the culture, the integrity, the honor, and the discipline of the Japanese. Um, my career actually began in 1982, the year you started the Lukis policy. So obviously that means you know my age roughly. Um, 40 years as a corporate lawyer, investment banker, and an advisor to public companies. But Tun, I totally agree with you because uh, in Shern Dalamore, as a young corporate lawyer, I, I put together the deal for um, Tokyo Hotels International to bring in the Pan Pacific Hotel next to Amno Building. Uh, at the time, as Premier, you, you, you oversaw all that. And uh, there were all these great companies that came to Malaysia, Shimizu, that joint ventured with Paremba, and the list goes on. I think the ethics and the discipline and value of Japanese corporations worldwide, even Taisei, I can just keep naming all those that I've worked with. Um, it, it, it is exemplary, and this is what we need for Malaysian corporations moving forward. In particular, Tun, when you talk about the values and the culture, one thing that I have learned in the last 40 years, and even moving into United Nations and World Bank circles, and doing all the global relations work I've done, the one that strikes me deeply is ikigai. Ikigai means a reason for being. And you know, during the COVID pandemic, when we're all locked down for two years, sitting at home and wondering what, what meaning life holds for us, Tun. And I remember that you have a passion for carving and you do wood carving. Ikigai talks about doing what you love, that's your passion. Doing what you're good at, which is being a statesman and a leader and, and defining how leaders should behave in all contexts doing what the world needs, which is, um, like we mentioned earlier, Tansri, planting thousands of trees and greening our planet and, and, and dealing effectively with climate change. And obviously, doing what you can get paid for. So this is what is lacking in this country, and I hope that the Lukis policy will continue, because I believe Your Excellency Ambassador for Japan and all the Japanese in the room, you will agree that Ikigai is your legacy for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Uh, Don't you may want to comment. <laughs> You're free to comment. <clears throat> She's all with I you. can say is that I agree very much with your view. When you have time on your hand, use the time for doing something. I, I have been asked by many people, how do how, is it that you became quite active at this um, late age? I believe that being active is very important. Active not only in terms of your physical self, but also your mental self. If you don't read, you don't write, you don't argue, you don't debate, the brain recedes. It goes into recession and you forget things. But if you keep on uh, reading a lot, writing, talking to people, debating, and making decisions and all that. Then the brain is active. And when it is active, I don't think you would lose control over your, your whole self. So it's important that when you have time, as you were forced to during the pandemic, you have a lot of time doing nothing, but you can always find something to do. Uh, I have not been carving wood for a long time. <laughs> it was not a great success with me. But uh, as you know, I write, I read, I, I become very active, even politically. Lots of people say it's about time that I rest. But I think if I rest, I will just, uh, well, float away. So, I would say that uh, the best medicine is uh, active, to be active. Be active both physically and mentally, and uh, you will may remain relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Tun. It's very good. Very good idea for all of us. Alison, is something, Alison? Um, Alison. 
Yes, Tun. I think uh, you've mentioned multiple times the need for um, a shift, a cultural shift, and a shift in the value systems. Now, throughout your vast experience, of course, how do you think can we initiate this cultural shift, especially in the current landscape? Is it a matter of what was mentioned, Ikigai, for example? Is it a matter, are we, are we heading towards, are we having a wrong mission, vision moving forward? Of course, at ISIS Malaysia, uh, a long time ago, we, uh, uh, along with yourself, uh, we crafted a vision 2020. Is it a matter of vision or is it a matter of practice of our daily life? And how do you think we can initiate that cultural shift and change in value system, Tun? But first of all, you must determine what kind of value system you should have. Having determined that, how do you change the value system of a community? It's very difficult with people who are old because their way of life has become uh, uh, calcified, fixed to the extent that they cannot change. So if we want to change the performance of anybody, even a whole country or certain races, you must begin when they were very young. In fact, uh, I think the Japanese started uh, in, instilling their values when the child is only three years old. When you begin very early, it becomes implanted in the thinking of the individual or the country or the people that even when they age, they become older, they will cling to the value system they were instilled with when they were young. So I was... Uh, I wanted to be Minister of Education the second time I had uh, the chance to become Prime Minister. But they told me that the Prime Minister has promised not to take on any other job except that of a Prime Minister. So I had to give up the idea of uh, uh, re to review and change the education system. But later on, uh, I had occasion to um, uh, sort of dismiss the Minister of Education and I became Minister of Education uh, temporarily. During that time, I tried to change the education system. Unfortunately, before I could do, before I could achieve anything, I was uh, practically booted out of the uh, uh, Prime Ministership. But if we want to do something about changing the future of a people, the best time to start is when you are very young, even at the kindergarten stage. Implant in them good values. Tell them, don't take what doesn't belong to you. Because when they grow old, they will think twice before they take something that doesn't belong to them. In other words, they don't steal anymore. Of course, corruption should be instilled in every person because corruption is what is going to destroy people, destroy countries, destroy our civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Tun. And Tun has a very important perspective, namely education. Very important. Uh, okay, I'd like to give the young lady in front of you in white scarf. You raise your hand. Of that, I get back to you. Young lady in front here. Please, introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Tan Sri. Um, Assalamualaikum, um, Tun. Um, my name is Umu. I'm um, pagi and Ohio as I must. Um, first of all, before I extend my question, I would like to say thank you so much for your service as a Prime Minister during your tenure. I've benefited um, from the LAP. Um, and I, myself, a graduate of MJIIT and University of Scuba myself. Um, I have a question, um, maybe generally in the energy sector or climate change. Um, what do you foresee or um, what do you think we can implement um, to take or tackle the climate change bilaterally um, between relationship between, in Malaysia, between relationship uh, bilaterally, Malaysia and Japan, um, as well as uh, as a citizen of one of the key oil and gas producer in the energy sector itself. How do you think and 
what is your view? Um, how can we be, uh, how to say, um, moving towards cleaner energy in the future? So I would like to know your view on the energy sector itself. So thank you so much. Thank you. Those question on the uh, climate change. <laughs> What's yeah. your Japan is a very expensive country. We cannot send too many students there because it costs a lot of money. Although the yen today has depreciated, even against the ringgit. So now I think we should send a lot more students to Japan to learn about the Japanese, about their culture, their value system, their business, etc. But better, better still, if we can bring Japan to Malaysia, I had suggested that we should have a Japanese university in Malaysia. The Americans have, the Australians have universities in Malaysia, the British have many universities, branch universities in Malaysia. And because Malaysia is relatively cheap, lots more people from many poorer countries can get a good education in Malaysia. But if the Japanese were to set up a university in Malaysia, then more people would be able to learn about the Japanese culture, the Japanese ethics, the Japanese way of doing business, etc. It will cost them less. And in fact, governments can probably give more scholarship if they were to come to Malaysia, where the cost of living is still much lower than that of Japan and many other countries. Unfortunately, the Japanese universities don't, do not have a tradition of uh, opening branch universities abroad. But traditions uh, can be uh, revised so that if they have a good university, I don't mind even if they teach in Japanese, but I thought that among the things they should teach in the Japanese universities is the tea ceremony. Because tea ceremony is simple, but it is a training in discipline to do things properly. We don't deviate, you don't add new ideas, but you do things because that's the way it is done. And when you have that kind of discipline to follow what should be done, you will also become even more successful. So what I would suggest is that if uh, there is anything that can improve on the performance of the Look East policy, it is the setting up of a Japanese university in uh, Malaysia, maybe subsidized by the Japanese government or even the Malaysian government, because I think it will do, it will give opportunities for not only Malaysian, but a lot of people from poor countries to come to Malaysia and study. We have become a sort of education hub in to many parts of the world. Uh, today, we have more than 100,000 students studying from other countries studying here in various universities. But I am sure that if we have a Japanese university, we can attract more students from poorer countries so that they too would have the benefit of a Japanese education, especially with regard to ethics. Thank you. Thank you, Tun. I see the Japanese ambassador, <laughs> Excellency, by taking down notes, Tun. <laughs> it's a very good practical suggestion. Anisan, I'll give you a floor and then I'll come back to the uh, assembly. I think we just have a few more a time for a few more questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to the floor. Um, perhaps Mr. Andrew and then. あ、それは、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
Then I wrote a thesis on PhD on Singapore economic growth uh, in uh, University of Malaya as well. So surpass, uh, I mean, the PhD is at Frank Japon. Then I'm teaching uh, some courses related to economics in Japanese university. My mission when I return to Japan, I, my personal mission is, I believe, is bringing students to Malaysia because I'm a product of Malaysia, right? So I was personally thinking that the bringing students, a Japanese student to Malaysia, I can see the remarkable change of Japanese student in Malaysia. It's a very short time program organized, including pre-departure study session. They learn many new things about Malaysia, unity in the, uh, in the harmless condition, uh, ethnic uh, relations. Those things are very new to us. Islamic religions, uh, halal uh, products, those are very new. So in this respect, I believe, uh, I think uh, one, f I mean, two-way flow is, I believe, strong, uh, it's this very important. I, uh, in this respect, I would like to seek your advice, how to enhance the flow from Japanese youth to studying in Malaysia. I would be very grateful if you, uh, 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 to Dr. Mahathir, kindly share your view. Thank you very much. <coughs> Terima kasih. Yang pertama saya ucap tanya, congratulations kerana uh, tuan dapat berbahasa Melayu dengan begitu fasih setelah berada di Malaysia selama 18 tahun. Agak susah bagi orang asing to learn Malay in Malaysia. If you go to Indonesia, whether you like it or not, you soon become fluent in the Indonesian language. But you cannot do that in Malaysia. Because Malaysians believe foreigners cannot speak their language. So if you, you come and speak in Malay to a Malaysian, he will reply in English. <laughs> because he assumes that you cannot understand my language. You must be able to speak, uh, understand English better. That is one thing about Malaysians, that uh, people who work here, live here for a long time, in fact, we have people who are Malaysian citizens who cannot speak Bahasa Malaysia. Malaysian citizens, maybe several generations in Malaysia, but still cannot speak fluently in Bahasa, Malay Bahasa Melayu. But there are good things you can learn from Malaysia. One thing that I would say is good about Malaysia is that we can have an election with no violence. There's no violence. We accept the result. Yes, we are not happy with a lot of wrong things which were done, like corruption and all that. But it didn't, did not result in violence in killing people. But in many countries, elections mean people would be killed. And after the results are announced, there would be a demonstration accusing the winner of cheating. Doesn't matter who the winner is, the winner will be accused of cheating. But in Malaysia, we know there's a lot of cheating done, but we have not become violent. That is something that I think a lot of other countries can learn from Malaysia. The other thing is the tolerance of Islam in Malaysia. We are not against uh, other religion. That is in accordance with the teachings of the religion of Islam, that you have to accept that there are people of other religion whose practices are different from yours. To them, their religion, to us, our religion. They can do what they think is uh, the right thing, and we can do what we think is the right thing. So we can tolerate people of different religions in Malaysia more than in many other countries. Yes, there is a tendency towards extremism, but so far we have not really uh, exploded into violence that you see in many countries. So if the Japanese students were to come here, among the things that they would learn is that uh, 
Number one, we are not a violent people. Number two, that Islam in Malaysia is a tolerant Islam. It is actually the true teachings of Islam. So then you will not have that um, uh, unfair uh, wish, uh, per, uh, uh, unfair uh, regard for Islam and the Muslim. We are not violent. There are other, other religions too can burst out into violence, but it is not exclusively among the Muslim. And in Malaysia, we have shown that. So that is, the, the, those are two things that you can learn from Malaysia. So I would welcome more Japanese students to come to study like you in Malaysia and to speak as fluently as you spoke Malay. Thank you. Thank you, Tun. I know, <laughs> so many hands there. Uh, I saw Bakang Saniskali right at the end there. And then I get back to you. Yeah? Uh, maybe a most, more question, kind of yeah. for the time. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is uh, Captain Mohammed Khan. Uh, Tun uh, Mahathir, thank you very much for your wonderful remarks. Uh, one thing you uh, mentioned was the rise of China and how that is a threat to Japan. Uh, every day in your EEZ, there are Chinese Coast Guard ships that are harassing Malaysian hydrocarbon explorations. How do you propose this look Asia strategy would work to tackle a common threat? Thank you. Well, we, we picture China as a threat because it is a threat to the current powers in the world. China may try to replace the number one country in this world. And that is not something that the number one country welcomes. And they would like us also not to welcome. But I have been to Japan every year to speak at the Nikkei conference on the future of the world. Among the things that I keep on repeating to them is that when you fight a war, and the war ends, that's the time to make peace. When you see what happens in Europe, there was a war against Germany. The whole of Europe was against Germany. But when the war ended, the British and the French have become good friends of Germany. They forget about the atrocities committed by the Germans, and I think by, by the French and the British also. We also see that in Japan, the Americans dropped two atom bombs on Japan. And yet after the war, Japan and America are good friends. So I don't see why we cannot forget the past and think about the present and the future. What if both Japan and China decide that to be friends again? to be friends, and stop building up a huge uh, arms race and all that. Stop that, because it's a waste of money. When you build uh, a powerful uh, the military force, you want to test it, and then you can, it can break out into a war, and maybe the war will become a world war. So I suggested that if you can be friendly, Japan can be friendly with America, why not Japan, Korea, be friendly with China? Yes, of course China wants to expand, but we can negotiate. I believe that war is, um, is very primitive. You solve problems by killing people, and you call yourself uh, civilized people. What would happen if I don't like you, I just take a gun and spray some bullets because I don't like you. This happens in America. But if we negotiate, nobody is killed, nothing is destroyed. But you look at what's happening now in Ukraine. Thousands of people 
both soldiers and civilians are killed, not only among the Ukrainians, but also among the Ru Russians, and the whole country is destroyed. You can see it on TV every day. And yet, I believe, even if it stops, the winner doesn't get anything, the loser also will not get anything. And the cost of rebuilding would be tremendous. It will run into $3 trillion at this moment. So why waste time when you end, you end the war and you cannot even get anything out of it except to have to spend money? But if you would negotiate or arbitrate or go to a court of law and decide the claim, whether it is, well, in a war you may, you may win, you may lose. But in negotiation also you may win and you may lose but there will be no cost. So I believe that uh, we should find a modus operandi with China, a growing China. You can't stop China from growing because they are a very hard-working people, very diligent, very skillful people. They're sending people to the moon. They can do whatever other people can do. So let's tolerate this uh, phase during the development of China. Uh, I think leadership is very important. Some leaders are very nice. Some leaders are not nice. <laughs> the German people are among the most cultured people in the world, and yet they produce Hitler, a man who killed, a, started a world war. So we have to tolerate Malaysia tolerated China for 2,000 years. We have had relation with China, but China never conquered Malaysia. The Portuguese came to Malaysia in 1509. Two years later, they came and they captured Malacca. Who should we be afraid of? China or Portuguese? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good answer. Very good. I, I'm sorry to use my position as chairman. We don't square very busy today. Maybe I just allow one more question. I have a friend in front of you. Your name, please. It's and as short as possible. Yes, thank you, Dantri. Uh, my name is Andrew Koo. I'm a lawyer here in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Tun, um, as we look back, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm sure Kato San's book would have dealt with uh, is the question, again, going back to ethics and values. J Jap Japan is a mono ethnic uh, society predominantly. We are a multiracial society. And in the 40 years that we look back, We've had challenges of increased Islamization. I, I slightly disagree with your, your view that it's very tolerant. I think of late it's become very aggressive. And then also, uh, when you became Prime Minister, you allowed privatization of education, and now we have different streams, and we have different ways of educating Malaysians. How do you see these issues as challenges to your Look East policy, and going forward for future governments wanting to continue with the Look East policy, how will this challenge or, uh, you know, become a, I don't know whether it's a threat or an opportunity uh, going forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, Malaysia is a multiracial country. Unfortunately, the development of the races are not at an even equal pace. Some do well, some don't. And we are seeing a gap between the rich and the poor, emphasized by the fact that the rich of one race and the poor of another race. This is a situation that can lead to violence. At some stage, the poverty-stricken people will resent the rich people and the country will not become stable. That is why we cannot change the race, but we can change the economic performance of the different races. We have to help the, the poorer people to catch up with the richer people. That is what we try to do. But uh, the richer people already have good ethics. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but during the present, the least, latest uh, election, we find that the poorer people accepted money in order to vote. The richer people didn't accept money. So the corruption is among the poor. So when you have poor people, 
they are much more likely to be corrupt than the richer people. The richer people also can be corrupt, but the amounts are very big. But here, for $200, $300, you can buy votes. So this kind of situation will be aggravated now because, that, because of this election, the identity of race becomes more important. They appeal, the, um, the indigenous people, the Bumi Putra feel that they have lost, that the other side has win. And therefore, the racial feeling has now become worse. What do you do? Do you uh, contribute to it? Or do you try to mitigate the situation by reducing the gap between the rich and the poor? It's no good saying that, well, forget about race. Just concentrate on rich and poor. But you know the performance of the, uh, the race with the greater capacity. When you give them an opportunity, they will benefit more than the poor people. For example, if you give a license to the poor people, they are likely to sell the license to get money up front. But if you give the license to the richer people, the rich people will understand how to make use of the license to enrich themselves. So when you treat equally both races, you are going to have unequal result, and the situation becomes worse. I have studied all these things for the past 80 years. That's uh, much longer than I think your age. <laughs> but what I say about this thing, people cannot refute, but they say that it is unfair. Well, it's up to us whether we want to continue a process that will divide the rich from the poor, the race from the other race. And in the end, there will be violence. Thank you, Tun. Thank you. Perfect way. Tun, cut the one more question. You've got two hands there. <laughs> okay, I'll give you the microphone, please. So, sorry about that. Short, short question, please. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. Tun, um, I'm Lukman from Proton Design and I can say that I'm a proud product of your policies since 1992. Um, we met last year in Parliament and because previously I was in the Ministers of Entrepreneurship Office and then now I'm completing my DBA a few months to go and part of my DBA is um, to have results and discussions, of course. So I would like to have some citations or anecdotes from you about what you envision for the automotive industry in Malaysia. Thank you very much, Tuan. Automotive. automotive industry. Well, this is an industry that is changing very rapidly. Uh, a lot of people say that the future is with electric cars because electric cars do not produce CO2. But when you generate electricity in the electric power plants, you also have to produce a lot of carbon dioxide. So it's only here less carbon, but the carbon is still there. So now the idea is that we should have hydrogen-driven cars. If you, you are behind time, you're going to lose out. So our research must go not only to, firstly to hybrid cars, followed by electric cars, followed by hydrogen uh, cars, hydrogen uh, powered cars. So that is the automotive industry. But we have to spend money on research, and research is very costly. That is where the government comes in. But we have, well, for some time now, the government has not given money for research. They give piddling sums of money that you can't do anything with it. But if we believe in research, we have to spend money on research in the automotive industry. 
because it is going to be changed over time. Just imagine if you uh, have electricity, electric cars, somewhere you have to generate electricity, and there the carbon dioxide will be emitted. But if you have hydrogen cars, the end result, the waste result of hydrogen cars is water. And water, you can again separate the hydrogen from the oxygen and use the hydrogen again. So that seems to be the solution to our environmental uh, problem, at least with regard to the automotive industry. Thank you, Tun. Uh, I'm sorry, all good things have got to come to an end. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Tun, for filling all the questions wonderfully. <laughs> I also learned a lot from you today. Um, uh, given the time, we, can, I mean, we cannot go beyond this uh, uh, session. And let's give Tun a bi big applause. Thank, thank you, you Yang Amat Babahagia, Tun Dr. Mahade Muhammad. Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub and Alizan Mahadi. Now, can I please invite His Excellency Takahashi Katsuhiko, Mr. Nishida Shigenobu and Ms. Akiko Kato to join everyone on stage for the book launching ceremony. Now, on to the moment that we have been waiting for. Can I please invite Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahade Muhammad to officiate the launching of the book. Thank you, Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun, Tan Sri, Ambassador and Mr. Nishida. You may return to your seats. along, can I please pass the floor to Ms. Akiko Kato to deliver her presentation. Tun Dr. Mahathir bin Mohammad, Tun Dr. Siti Hasma, Tan Sri Dr. Suleiman Mahbob, Ambassador Katsuhiko Takahashi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to be on this stage to launch 40 years of Lukey's policy. I became journalist at the same year that Lukey's policy was advocated by Tun Dr. Mahathir as a core policy. 
At that time, I was very surprised that the key political leaders in Southeast Asia wanted to adopt the life and work style of Japanese. I learned at school in Japan how Japan treated its people with atrocities during the last war. I just wonder the person who went through the previous war adopted uh, Luki's policy. And why copy from Japanese? Luki's policy made me interested in Asia rather than the West as a journalist. I went to the library and trying to find a book written by Tun Dr. Mahathir. I borrowed the book Malay Dilemma and learned the history of Malaysia and why Malaysia is made up of Malays, Chinese, and Indian. After colonized by the West, Chinese and Indians were brought as labor here in Malaysia, working in plantation, etc. They work hard and save money and establish their own business. Whereas Malays were the locals in the countryside doing agriculture and fishery, Malaysians endowed with abundant natural resources. So Malays didn't, didn't have much competition. After the independence from British, Malaysia was struggling to harmonize these three races. Unfortunately, end up with the 1969 riot. And the ruling party, AMNO had to solve these racial problems by introducing Bumiputra policy. I am sure that this history is very familiar to you. But for Japanese, to understand why Tun wanted to advocate Luki's policy, we Japanese have to know the history of Malaysia way back from the colonization by the West. That is why I started this book to explain about the history of Malaysia. The Lukis policy was the driving force to convert Malaysia from an agriculture to an export-oriented ori industrial country, whereas Bumiputra policy changed the uneven distribution of wealth that existed in Malaysia. So LEP and Bumiputra policy were like two wheels of a, chair, of a car. The road ahead with both policy was for Malaysia to be modernized and become developed nation in 2020. That was Tun's uh, vision, uh, Wawasan 2020. On the profound cooperation between the two nations, especially in 1980s to 90s, Malaysia has successfully become one of Southeast Asia's leading industrial nations. Under the LEP, supporting industries were nurtured along with the entry of large Japanese companies into Malaysia. One of the reasons for the success was the role played by JAKTIM, the Japanese Chamber of Trade and Industry, Malaysia. JAKTIM and MAIDA worked together to create a win-win relationship for both sides by improving the investment environment for the manufacturing industry. In particular, it has achieved success in the field of electronics, automobile, and distribution. In order to build up the supply chain, you need SMEs to be the key factor. In this book, I wrote the history of how Malaysia de developed economically while maintaining ethnic harmony, focusing on the Lukis policy. I first met Dun during financial crisis in 1997 in Hong Kong. He was attacking George Soros straightforward when I was attending a press conference. Malaysia was able to overcome the Asian economic crisis in a short period of time by introducing currency control under the leadership of Tun. I interviewed Tun after the general election in 1999 when AMNO lost quite a number of seats. He said that he will rethink the Bumiputra policy. The Bumiputra policy has been introduced, introduced for many years and the benefited Malays have stopped striving hard. So it is time for us to change this policy. Then I asked him whether I could write this and he said yes. I remember that his press secretary was sitting right next to me, got so surprised that he even dropped his pen on the floor. Japan, which had been striving to overtake the United States economically, was also touted as the second economic superpower 
But after that, it lost its goal and experienced economic stagnation due to the Lehman shock, etc. In instead, China emerged as the manufacturing hub of the world. Before stepping down in 2003, Tun focused the policy on education in Malaysia. He urged elementary school to teach math and science in English. Also, in order to harmonize Malays, Chinese, and Indian, he introduced high school age students for a certain period, live together in a dormitory, and do volunteer activities together. He also wanted Japanese university to make a branch in Malaysia to teach in Japanese ways. MJIIT is one of the educational attempts which both countries achieved. In this book, I wanted to focus on the educational as aspect of Luki's policy. Education is fundamental aspect of LEP. There are 8,900 LEP students with government scholarship who studied in Japan in university, graduate school, uh, technical college, etc. after L LEP was introduced. If we add JICA short-term study program, 175,000 scholars and bureaucrats went to Japan. But if you include those with privately uh, financed student, it will be more. Tun told me that Japanese people show their sense of responsibility in various other ways. If it falls within their scope of work, or if it is their subordinate that made an error, they assume uh, responsibility. When they fail at work, the subordinate themselves fe feel responsible for causing others trouble. Therefore, Japanese people feel a very strong sense of responsibility for their work, doing their best to avoid failure. Making a single product, they strive to make it the best and highest quality as not to gain a bad reputation. It was very challenging when Malaysia first tried to introduce the learn from the Japanese, Luki's policy, for it was quite unique. Tun Dr. Mahathir wanted Malaysian to get half or even a quarter or how the Japanese feel and think about the shame of failure. With that mindset, he believed Malaysian would not be producing goods of poor quality and not fail when tasked with a mission. Ultimately, it would save Malaysia from paying the tremendous price of failure. This was the philosophy of Luki's policy, I believe. In my last chapter, I interviewed five alumni students who are the role model of Luki's policy. Dr. Moi Meng Ling is the leading expert on Tengu fever, aiming to develop a vaccine in School of Health at University of Tokyo as a professor. She also represents Japan as researcher at the WHO expert meeting on the COVID-19. She said in the interview that Dr. Mahathir led Malaysia through a vibrant era. He listened to the voice and still walking beside them. It is blessing that both government have provided multiple scholarship for the younger generation to study abroad. In her opinion, those who have received the scholarship should not take the opportunity lightly, nor for granted, but remain humble and grateful. And she added that she hopes that both government will continue provide scholarship to those who are talented and in, 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 in need. Mr. Zulfika, who is the president of Alips, the government-funded LEP Alumni Association told me in the interview that he was a member of soccer team in Wakayama University. If you can use the field to play soccer for one hour, the team will stop practicing in 50 minutes and spend the remaining 10 minutes for maintenance of the field. This is what we can learn from Japanese. But don't say, just work hard. Malaysian will never understand. The most important things about Japanese ethics, which underlies with Luki's policy, is consideration to others. Well, actually, Zulfika is now uh, in uh, one of the company, uh, and he's the managing director in uh, Iskandal project. Ali Izat is the youngest who appear in my book. He's Malay, now studying in Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo as LEP government-funded student in the future. He wanted to become a politician. I myself started a summer school 
for high school students in Japan to educate them to become leaders in various fields. Now I inv invite from Asian countries, including uh, from Malaysia. Uh, the, the, uh, the school is called Japan Future Leader School. Tun Dr. Mahathir and Tun City Hasma comes to my school every year uh, consecutively for 19 times to teach them how to solve borderless problems such as war, global warming, etc. Ali was one of the students participated in my school several years ago and now LEP student to Japan. He says that he is learning in Japan about contribution to the society, not living for yourself but for someone else. Preparing for this book, I found the two speeches delivered by uh, the Prime Minister of both countries in 1983, when Tun first visited Japan after becoming Prime Minister and introduced LEP. Please find both Tun and Mr. Nakasone, our Prime Minister at that time, uh, which is in my book. Tun said, and I quote, since the dawn of time, our eyes only look towards the West. However, from now on, we need to build a balanced relationship between the West and the East. It is not material wealth or advanced technology that we Malaysians want to imitate, but it's, it is the work ethic, the Japanese attitude, and the management system we need to learn from, because I believe this is the secret of Japan's rapid economic development. PM Nakasone praised Tun for not only what he had done for the national building, but also for its positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of Southeast Asia. At that time, Kampuchea uh, had a very big problem. And then Nakasone mentioned the fact that Japan has been chosen as one of model country to which you seek for tradition, traditional Asian ethics is a great honor for the people of Japan and means Japan has an extremely heavy responsibility to fulfill. At the same time, this provides us Japanese with great opportunity to learn from the Malaysian people. I expect that mutual understanding between the people of our two countries will be further deepened through the promotion of the Lukis policy to which the government of Japan is de determined to extend utmost cooperation. While reading both speeches, I believe that both countries must make effort to return to the starting po point right now. I am very happy that Tun's idea to establish branch of Japanese university in Malaysia will come true next year. University of Tsukuba will open branch uh, in September. When Tun became PM in 2003, he immediately came to Japan and asked for the establishment of Japanese university in Malaysia during the bilateral meeting with PM uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe. Tun said education is the foundation of the nation. In order to develop a nation, each citizen must have in-depth knowledge. Each must be able to discern right from wrong and each must be able to judge what is necessary for the prosperity of the nation. Education must be reformed from scratch. To do this, it is necessary to learn from the Japanese people who gave a strong sense of morality and are hardworking. PM Abe reacted immediately. This is one of the reasons Tun was the first prominent leaders in the world who came to Japan to visit to mourn after a few days when Mr. Abe was assassinated. I hope that both government will continue sending many young people with dreams will study in both countries. As chair of AFS International Programs Japan, myself, our, our organization hosts 200 Japanese government full scholarship for high school students from 20 Asian uh, different countries and territories, including from Malaysia, to study in high school for one year. I made that uh, the most number for Malaysian. <laughs> so uh, the younger you come, they can absorb different culture easily. This project is called Asia Kakehashi Project. Kakehashi means bridge over, was also advocated by Mr. Shinzo Abe when he was prime minister. 
I hope that the young generation, both in Malaysia and Japan, will learn from each other importance of respecting different race, culture, and religion, living harmoniously. Tun, I would like to thank you for all the years you contributed as politician to make this world better. Now it is time for you to lecture all over the world to the young generation to stop the war and create peace. There is no time to waste for you because the world needs your wisdom to save this planet from war and solving borderless problems. Terima kasih. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you, Ms. Akiko Kato, for your presentation. May I please invite Mr. Alizan Mahadi, Senior Director of Research, ISIS Malaysia, to moderate the question and answer session. Alizan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to congratulate Kato-san for, um, I think, a very, producing a very important book that will be a, a very significant contribution as a record for posterity, but I think also it will be a very important contribution about how we move forward as well amongst, within the 40 years of the experience in Luke's policy because I think we can learn a lot from the successes but also the failures as well within those 40 years. I think you gave a very good account of um, the history of the Lukis policy, but also of, of development in Malaysia as well. I had a, a brief read-through last night of your book. Uh, I didn't finish it, unfortunately, but I think I was quite impressed by the knowledge of the history within Malaysia. I was also taken aback by the anecdotal impacts of the Lukis policy that you've captured from your interviews. So, Again, congratulations for, for producing this book. Okay, uh, I would like to open the floor for questions. We have a very short time for questions, just about 10 minutes for now, but don't worry. Uh, Ms. Akiko Kato will be also on the next panel. Uh, but for now, if there's any questions regarding uh, her remarks just now and the book itself, uh, please, I open the floor for questions. Do I have any questions from the floor? Please, the gentleman over there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Please, go ahead. Right. During the remarks, it was mentioned that, that there was a need to return to the starting point of the Lukis policy. Again, 40 years on, what exactly would returning to the starting point mean? Scott Sun, what would be going to the starting point of Lukis policy mean? Yes, uh, actually, uh, as Tun described um, before, that uh, the meaning of Lukis policy is not not just about development or to become wealthy uh, economically, but we have to go back to the philosophy of Lukey's policy, uh, discipline and also um, harmonious way. And then I really respect um, Malaysians uh, especially like uh, as uh, Tun described that uh, after the election, no riots or anything. So I think um, when uh, Tun uh, first advocated Lukey's policy, he wanted to learn from uh, Japan, uh, especially the way uh, we are uh, living uh, naturally. Actually, like in Edo period, uh, we had like 260 years of uh, very peaceful uh, period when uh, uh, the shogun uh, was there. And then uh, we had this sort of um, uh, temple, school, school in the temple. And Small children learn there, you know, as like um, sit straight, you know, when you, when you listen to teacher, you have to be very quiet, and then you have to behave yourself, blah, 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 blah. And I think that is really one of the origin uh, way back, which is the Lukey's policy uh, kind of uh, uh, philosophy. So, um, I don't know, I haven't actually, I haven't, I was not he been here 
during the election, but I heard that there are lots of youngsters, um, young generation. Now, uh, is it 18 years old that you can vote? Only 18, yes. Under and 18. I was just wondering what kind of education they got. And then, um, I'm sorry to say this, maybe I'm very rude to say this, please forgive me, but while um, uh, in Malaysia, money politics uh, was prevailed, and then these uh, adults, these uh, adults was uh, greedy in money. These youngsters, what were they doing? Were they in mosque and had education? And actually, in Japanese newspaper, um, it was not described, but I was, I, I was very much shocked to know that the extremist of uh, extreme uh, Malay, uh, one of the uh, part, uh, political party, got the most uh, seats, 49 votes. And when I covered uh, Malaysian uh, election in 19, GE in 1999, I believe uh, only 10 seats or so. So I think really the education for the youngster is very important. And then it is, it is you know, we don't have, we, we shouldn't waste time um, uh, doing uh, greedy things. So it's, it's the same in Japan as well. Uh, in Japan now, uh, politics is very chaotic. Well, we don't have, uh, uh, well, and then, but we don't have a strong leader. And then um, we don't know which direction we are going in the future. So for both countries, I think we should really go back to 1981 when he delivered, Tun delivered um, uh, the speech for starting this uh, Lukis policy. Thank you, Katasan. Again, once again, education value system features strongly, I think. But, but if, if I may here, let, let me um, ask you another dimension of the Lukis policy, which is the economic dimension. One of the key ideas behind the Lukis policy is the Malaysia Inc., which was modeled after the Japan Inc. idea. Um, within Japan, how is the idea of Japan Inc. perceived now? Is it still a relevant model or is it something that is also uh, evolving? And is it something that Malaysia can, can, uh, can or should continue to model after? What are your thoughts? I think both countries, Malaysia Inc. or Japan Inc. should continue. Um, well, maybe like 20 or 30 years, well, 30, 20 years ago or so, that uh, like with our ODA, official ODA project, um, not only Japanese com companies, but also uh, uh, foreign countries could enter. Well, that is, what, that is also a good idea, but on the other hand, that the Japanese companies were losing. So, uh, to, to a certain extent, I think uh, the idea of uh, uh, the company, uh, what, what I mean is that government and also private sector should work together. I think it is very important, especially now with uh, many, uh, I think um, the world is divided and uh, we should, but, but, but I think, uh, I think cooperation with other country is also important. Thank you. Um, can I get any more questions from the floor, please, the gentleman in the second row? Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. A very good uh, afternoon and konnichiwa. Um, I would like to ask this question. Uh, you did mention something about education, right? So, um, in educational aspects, what would be your hope and vision after writing the book, of course? for the future in seeing the development and betterment of the Look East policy 
to promote educational progress, uh, not only to Malaysia, but uh, to Japan as well. Thank you. Well, I think really um, the education uh, is the most important key. Um, especially um, if you think about uh, economic development, you first have to begin with education. I think that is why Tun uh, both uh, started uh, in 1982, um, uh, promote, uh, promote uh, investment to, to, to Malaysia, and also uh, to recruit uh, young people in Malaysia. Uh, so I think um, for Malaysian student, um, not only Malaysian student, but for Japanese student or any other student, I think it, the most important part of education is that uh, to um, study abroad when you are young. Because if you stick in your own country, well, I am very, uh, I envy you because you have lots of uh, varieties of races. So you can harmonize, right? But in Japan, usually um, maybe more than 90% consists only Japanese. So I really strongly urge the Japanese young people to study abroad and then to have uh, not, only, um, uh, the, not only study uh, uh, technically or advanced uh, studies, but also um, value system of the country that you go and these kind of things will hit the bright future because the young people are the ones who have to survive and then look at the global warming situation right now. Uh, Tun came to, um, to the P Fukuoka Prefectural uh, uh, Agriculture Center and then um, I showed uh, the Malaysian delegation that now they are preparing um, rice field uh, which can um, uh, maintain uh, the rice e even though the even though the water in the rice paddy is over 40 degrees uh, in temperature so you know we have to study advanced technology of course but also, we have to learn from the people. And the most easy way is to go abroad. Thank you. I think certainly the people-to-people -people exchange is, is very important. And I myself have been privileged enough to also have the opportunity to study in Japan as well. Uh, but unfortunately, um, my hair was already losing when I was there, so my brain was a bit calcified. But I hope to, 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 uh, to practice some of the things I learned in Japan. OK, we have room for one more question. Um, uh, this um, is Mr. Andrew. Do you have a question before we close this session? Yes, thank you. Uh, Andrew Ku again. Kato-san, thank you very much for the book. I look forward to uh, getting a copy and reading it. Um, as we look back 40 years, we also want to look forward. And of course, we see that in, over 40 years, both Malaysia and Japan have uh, developed as societies. Is there anything uh, that has developed in Japanese society that you would suggest to Malaysia that we do not follow? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, many things, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, um, yes, uh, let me see. <laughs> well, I think um, we don't have a strong leadership like Tun. That is what we don't want to. Uh, I, I wish, uh, why don't you become the Prime Minister of Japan? <laughs> <laughs> now you have a chance. <laughs> so I think um, we follow uh, American ways and uh, also we are defeated by US and we have kind of like a psyche uh, in our minds that um, 
uh, we are, uh, U.S. is superior. So therefore, even now, uh, as he mentioned about the relationship with China, I also agree uh, that, well, once uh, Tun was explaining to me that you cannot change the ge uh, geography. So, China is right next to us, right? Korea as well, and North Korea as well. We cannot change that. So how we can solve problems? With, um, we, we cannot go into war, right? So, uh, I think the most best way for us Japanese, we are from a very isolated uh, island, as you know, in the far, far east. So, um, maybe um, North Korea might invade us, right? Because of, well, so many times right now they are shooting all of these uh, things. And then I was thinking, as, uh, as you know, that um, U.S. didn't drop atomic bomb to Kyoto, Nara, uh, they, because they wanted to preserve the history and the culture of temples and shrines. So I was just telling the government officials uh, a week ago that we should promote more tourists and we should promote more students to come to Japan. If so many foreign students and foreign foreigners are traveling in Japan, no other country cannot bomb us, right? <laughs> so we should go into the tourism uh, and also this kind of uh, you know, um, area is uh, very key, important for us, what I think. So I don't know whether it it is an answer to you. But <laughs> Thank you, Dr. San. We, we've come to the uh, closing part of, of the opening session. And once again, I would like to congratulate you for producing such an important book um, uh, for Malaysia and I think for Japan as well. Um, let me leave uh, the floor with, with one anecdote of mine in my experience in Japan and the interaction I had with my professor. Um, my professor was speaking about, in terms of research, the pride in Japan of even designing and engineering a piece of screw. And this really took me aback because you can see the pride and attention to detail in research being undertaken in Japan. And I think, as we've discussed many times today, the people-to-people the -people exchange, education and the value system, there's many things that we can learn. And of course, look, this policy has been instrumental for Malaysia, and I think there are many things we can continue to learn from uh, the Japan work ethic, from the Japan Japanese value system moving forward as well. With that, I'd like to thank you once again and congratulate you once again. Please give a, uh, a hand of applause for Katsu-san. And thank you all of you for uh, participating in this session. Domo arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you, Ms. Akiko Kato and Alizan Mahadi. You may return to your seats. Thank you, Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahade Muhammad for delivering the keynote address of the 40 Years of Look East Policy 1982-2022 book launch and the Malaysia-Japan Forum. ISIS Malaysia would like to express our deepest gratitude to Yang Amat Muhammad Tun, Mah Tun Dr. Mahade Muhammad and Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasma Muhammad Ali for taking time to grace this occasion. We would like to invite Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Mahadeh Muhammad and Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasma Muhammad Ali accompanied by Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub and other distinguished guests to the holding room for refreshments.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas from ISIS Malaysia. Uh, thanks, Haris, for yielding the floor to me uh, without being asked. Uh, we're going to get the show on the road because we have about 20 odd minutes to wrap this session up. Now, uh, we are here for a forum on Malaysia Japan relations in a changing regional landscape, and the forum will focus on. Uh, current developments as well as future directions. Uh, we have three speakers on the panel today. Uh, we have His Excellency, the Ambassador of Japan, uh, Takahashi Katsuhiko. Uh, we have Dr. Aiko uh, Kato, our, our author. And lastly, we have Dr. Gita Govindasamy. Now, she hasn't been introduced yet. Uh, Dr. Gita is a senior lecturer focusing on Northeast Asia at the University of Malaya. Uh, without further wasting any time and to hope to give everyone a chance of at least one or two questions, I would like to turn over the floor to His Excellency the Ambassador, maybe a quick four to five minute uh, introduction to kick it off. Thank you, sir. Yeah, th th thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm really happy to be here to talk about the 40 years anniversary of the Christo policy. And uh, I'm not going to touch upon the achievement in the past too much because everybody's aware. And uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir already mentioned a little bit. So maybe I should rather concentrate on the way forward. Please. And usually what I have been saying in, this, in these days is uh, uh, modif modifying uh, rookies of policy according to the needs uh, in the current environment. Uh, there are two scopes uh, we have in mind. One is expanding the existing scope of Lukista policy that is traditionally manufacturing and industrialization. So LEP 2.0, which was adopted on the 30th anniversary, is one element. And I think we can develop the scope of manufacturing accordingly, including like a digital economy, aviation, maybe space technology, and maybe climate change is another area of cooperation. But the second uh, area for modifying the scope is rather outside of traditional request policy, as I have stated uh, in my uh, remarks at the beginning. That is aging society or disaster risk reduction. All those elements are really outside the portfolio of MITI, uh, the current ministry in charge in Malaysian government. So I think without introducing interministerial coordination inside Malaysia, uh, we won't be able to expand the scope of Rukisa policy. So this is a message which I have been saying to the Malaysian government. Please don't limit the LEP on manufacturing, but please try to include other ministries in charge uh, so that we can have wider scope. Because in case of aging, healthcare is one element. Uh, pension system is another element how to provide recreation to the old ages is also another element. So various ministries are in involved. So from now on, I think, look at the policy, have to involve another ministry in government in Malaysia. This is one of the messages I want to mention. Concerning the change of approaches, I think there are two uh, change of approaches. One is make the look at the policy two ways, as somebody has already mentioned in today's session. Two way means balanced exchange of people to people. In terms of tourism, before the COVID, from Japan to Malaysia, the visitor's number was 400,000. But from Malaysia to Japan, 500,000. Already equal. When it comes to the students, uh, we also talk about this type of issue. But the, before the COVID, Japanese students studying in Malaysia was 3,000. Japanese, Malaysian students studying in Japan was 3,000 also. So already equal. So actually we already had achieved almost equal people to people exchange without being noticed by anybody. But I think we need to enhance this aspect. We can increase the number, increase the number of tourists. We can increase the number of students who, who study both Japan and Malaysia. So I think this is one thing we can uh, continue doing that. And another thing is partnership. We are no longer donor and recipient. We are not a teacher and the students. We are rather the equal party to work together for the benefit of third country, as somebody already had mentioned. So 
Japan, Malaysia cooperated to provide assistance to Palestine, for example. We have a good reason to do the same to Afghanistan, for example. And of course, Myanmar will be one of the important issues when we think about partnership between Japan and Malaysia. So this is one thing we want to put special emphasis on. At the same time, as I was very much inspired by the comments uh, from the participants that advocating LEP to other countries. If we need to do that, look at the policy in Malaysia have to be the successful example. So Malaysia shouldn't fail in look at the policy. And as long as you provide us a success story of look at the policy, I think we will be able to advocate this to the other country. In particular, I have Middle Eastern country in mind who, can who need to achieve the coexistence of modern industrial development while maintaining Islamic value. So that's what I want to say at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I think that was a, was a very good uh, uh, overview of, of looking forward in the LEP, which is a key conversation that we need to have. I would ask that uh, audiences uh, perhaps think of their interventions and questions focusing on uh, you know, looking at moving forward. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Geeta, uh, another four to five minutes from you. Doc, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think to go forward, we have to go back to the basics. Um, much has been uh, talked about Japanese values and cultures and work ethics and all that. But if you look at uh, the literature on Look East policy, what uh, the discourse on Look East policy, uh, uh, there's not much. People do not talk about values, ethics. It's more to how to attract investments. What can Malaysia do to attract investments to adapt to, uh, you know, uh, uh, industrial uh, fourth industrial revolution and so on and so forth. So I would like to look into the education part in the sense that, um, of course, there has to be a reset in the uh, education system, but that would require an, another conference on its own, right? So, <laughs> since I'm from the University of Malaya, let me just give you an example of, uh, you know, what is the byproduct of uh, Look East policy. Uh, at the University of Malaya, we have a Department of East Asian Studies. It's a byproduct of uh, Look East policy, where um, the program actually, the Japanese program actually started uh, way before in 1996. The founder of the Japanese program is here, uh, Dr. Nasruddin. Um, but what is very sad about inculcating values, learning about Japan and all that in the education system, uh, actually in the tertiary education system is that uh, among all the public universities, only the University of Malaya has a department of East Asian Studies with a comprehensive uh, program on Japan, Korea and China. Right? No, no other university, public university has such a program. This is after 26 years of its inception. It is the only uh, kind. Uh, I think all public universities should have such a comprehensive uh, program. What uh, there is now is Japanese language courses in almost all the public universities, but no, uh, uh, you know, a full-fledged program where you learn about Japanese politics, uh, um, uh, ec economy, uh, social, and so on and so forth. I think uh, to go forward to, um, you know, to inculcate Japanese values, uh, work ethics, management principles, and so on and so forth, uh, the younger generation needs to get educated. And we have a large pool of young people who are very interested in Japan, uh, but not everyone can go to Japan, right? So we need to build our Japan program uh, uh, all through the country in all the public universities. I think that is one of the uh, most important, um, uh, you know, plan that can achieve, uh, you know, going back to that basics of learning why Japan is so uh, great or why Japan uh, managed to recover from World War II and so on and so forth. Um, uh, the fact that uh, we might have Tsukuba University 
uh, uh, branch campus coming uh, into Malaysia. I don't know when, uh, probably in September or next year. Uh, I hope that that will actually uh, encourage more universities, uh, Japanese universities, other Japanese universities. I'm sure uh, Professor Ichiro would like to bring Soka University. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a start. We need that because uh, we can't send all our students back to, I mean, go uh, to Japan uh, itself. So I think that is one way. And the other thing that I would like to also mention about University of Malaya is that uh, because there's so much of uh, interest in Japan, we have um, individuals, you know, individuals make a lot of difference in the Look East policy in bridging, uh, or not bridging, but bringing together uh, Japan and Malaysia. Uh, for example, we have uh, Malaysia Japan uh, Research Center headed by Dr. Jamila, uh, which actually does a lot of uh, research on uh, Japan and Malaysia, and also Japan per se. And, um, we also have MAJAS, this is Malaysian Association of uh, Japanese Studies. So the interest is there, but the outlet, you know. Um, uh, for how then can students actually access uh, these programs? So one is to increase the number of Japanese programs, but to increase the number of Japanese programs, we need funding. So where do we get the funding from? Uh, I don't think the government of Malaysia would be able to equip all public universities with a Japan program. So I actually studied in the International University of of uh, Japan in Niigata Ken. And what was very interesting is it's a private university. Uh, very interesting, almost all the uh, uh, international students managed to get sponsorships, scholarships, fellowships, because almost all uh, major Japanese corporations had a scholarship, uh, uh, you know, some sort of a fellowship uh, uh, named under them, you know. So I hope that Jaktim. Uh, Jaktim, Jaika, uh, will play a larger role in the education sector. But I also have to thank Jaktim, Japan Foundation, Embassy of Japan, for uh, supporting all the Japanese programs, uh, Japan-related programs, uh, activities in Malaysia. So I think that is one way to go forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gita. Um, if you saw the folks who were chuckling nervously just now in the second row, they are probably the ones that Dr. Gita was mentioning. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, do a quick break now. I was informed by the organizers that we have until 1.20, 1.25. Uh, I was also indirectly informed that we are the only thing standing between you guys and your lunch. Um, so, Dr. Gita, I have a question for you right now. Uh, so, you know, your focus on East Asia, you look at uh, the Republic of Korea as well. And you know, Malaysia will be uh, looking at, the, uh, at its look at its policy with South Korea next year. Uh, as a scholar who looks at both policies and both countries, I wonder if you could perhaps articulate uh, what stands out here uh, when it comes to Japan, or what differentiates Japan, and how can this be brought forward into the future? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I don't know what differentiates Japan, but uh, I think it's quite unfair to compare South, South Korea and Japan because South Korea um, came into LEP one year later. So the Koreans are going to celebrate LEP next year, not this year. Okay, so we have two LEPs here. Um, I think the basic, because LEP, uh, you know, the creation of LEP, the establishment of LEP came from the Malaysian side. What did Malaysia look towards uh, Northeast Asian countries, you know? So again, you're back to Japanese, uh, Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese, uh, you know, cultural values, management principles, and all that. And uh, if you look at South Korea, South Korea also modeled its economy in the early years after Japanese uh, economy. So to say that, uh, you know, what is the difference or what Japan has more than uh, South Korea, I think it's quite unfair. Yeah. No problem. I mean, uh, and, and it would be remiss of me not to give uh, the ambassador a chance to respond to my slightly uh, naughty question. Uh, please, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, when when uh, Prime Minister uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir announced the uh, the policy, uh, the Korea was already in the scope. Uh, and uh, I think the point is Malaysia wants to learn from Japan and Korea uh, the development model uh, of Malaysia. Therefore, it's really up to Malaysia how you are going to draw a lesson from what we have done. So I can talk about Japan, Malaysia, but I don't know much about Japan, Korea. 
uh, Korean embassy here is preparing for the celebration next year, and I'm really looking forward to see what will be the difference between Japan and Korea in terms of LEP. We are moving, we are doing the same thing, and I think we are continue to contribute. But I think there should be some difference of nuances, and I'm really looking forward to witness it next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Kato, the floor is yours for uh, the next five minutes. Okay. Well, I have talked a lot, so <laughs> it will be short. But um, if I, uh, I suggest you uh, that, uh, well, for AFS Japan, we get a lot of uh, scholarship for Japanese uh, high school students to, uh, uh, to stay in different countries, like 30 other countries, and it is funded by Mitsubishi Corporation. So you should go to Mitsubishi. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, there are lots of companies uh, based in uh, Southeast Asian countries. And um, I think we should uh, think about that, uh, you know, go to di directly to these companies because they also want um, they w also want to recruit um, a very intelligent uh, agents. And as you know that uh, Japan is uh, uh, entering this age society, and we have lots of problems with uh, nurseries uh, and also hospitals, uh, age home. We really need uh, these uh, sectors. And also uh, high tech, IT. There are lots of Indians now um, working in Japan, and uh, I think uh, many companies are now conducting uh, business in English as well. Well, not many, but uh, at least uh, they are starting to. So I think that is uh, about education. But also, uh, I think the economic aspect of the Lucky's policy also calls for a shift from assembly type uh, manufacturing to high end manufacturing. Uh, but I believe it is also important to emphasize the basics. People always talk about high tech, high tech, high tech. However, today, uh, well, um, uh, well, he was here. In, this morning, but he left already, but uh, Dato Ichiro Suzuki, uh, he was in the audience, and he's the chairman of the small and medium enterprise division of Jacktem. And uh, I wrote about him as well in the book, and he is managing director of Maida. Uh, he always tells me that it is important to nurture supporting industry and make them take roots. Japanese uh, companies brought over parts manufacturer from Japan, and over a long period of time, Malaysia-born SME has nurtured. And this is very, very, very important. If we neg neglect basic industries, the people will not be able to survive in the future if something happens abroad. Look at now, uh, because of this Ukraine uh, incident, and then the wheat, uh, wheat, oil, you name it, everything is very, getting very expensive. This is what we experienced during COVID-19 as well. Essential goods disappeared from a uh, supermarket, right? And um, actually like masks and also uh, uh, sanitizing these uh, hands, the alcohols. I asked in the pharmacy wh uh, why, um, why it disappeared from the pharmacy and found out that most of the product were producing in China. For the alcohol, we have them, but the container were all uh, produced in China, and they wanted to keep only in China. So we had really a sh shortage of that. From the point of view of security, it is very important to produce essential goods. So in my point of view, inter introducing new innovation and preserving basic manufacturing are equally important. We also have to think about that, not only jump only to high tech. In the same context, also, as I mentioned about agriculture is also uh, one of the key points that uh, in LEP, um, I think we can move forward. Uh, 
Well, actually, when I, I talk about this, uh, about the uh, rice paddy, but also uh, Tun uh, inspected um, the Fukuoka Prefectural Agricultural Research Center, and then they are producing this huge, big uh, strawberry called Amao. Actually, Amao means uh, king of sweetness. And then uh, it took like several years to, um, because uh, they have to match the seeds and everything, how sweet they can make it. So, um, you know, um, to export agriculture is also one of the key points. And also you have halal, right? So, uh, one of my um, donators to my school, he, he is a um, soya sauce uh, producer in uh, Kyushu, in the southern island. And then uh, he now has a very big uh, factory in Malaysia, and he is uh, making halal soy sauce. And if uh, Jackim has a very, what do you say, uh, very strict uh, uh, regulation, so if, uh, if those uh, food industry in Japan can be successful making uh, the product here, then that means that they can uh, export to Middle East. So this is also, I think, a very important area that we can also focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what is abundantly clear, uh, not just from this panel and from the discussion in morning, it, from the discussion today morning, is uh, the focus on the future clearly needs to be not just on what Malaysia and Japan can learn from each other, but what we can do together. And uh, as the ambassador said, this would require uh, a multi-stakeholder, multi-ministerial effort, in fact, to fully realize. Uh, yes, Dr. Gita, I see your hand up, please. I feel like a student. <laughs> no, no, Thomas, I just wanted to interject because uh, to go forward, you need to have a stable government because in the last couple of years, uh, the instability, the political instability has made it such that uh, inattention towards the LEP has become a feature, right? So that is one of the most important factors that we have to look into also. So I hope the present government, the new government, will have a uh, you know, plan forward in terms of LEP and the attention to its uh, LEP will, uh, you know, come back, uh, despite the fact that, you know, uh, our um, uh, economic relations with China is progressing very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gita. Uh, if, if, if you guys thought my interjection on uh, comparing with South Korea was naughty, you do not want to hear me talk about uh, my views on a stable government in Malaysia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I open up the floor. We have time for questions. Uh, please do raise your hand. I would ask that those who have not already interjected or commented, uh, please do so this time. Sir, I see your hand right there. Do we have someone to pass him a microphone? Apparently, we do not. Uh, Harry, sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to like do double duty here. <laughs> Oh, no, no, sorry, you, you can try the mic. Thank you very much for lending me the microphone. Uh, my name is Yalkun Uluyol. I am from Turkey, a researcher at ICMAS. I have a question to Ambassador, possibly all the uh, distinguished uh, panelists. So we talked about uh, Japan-Malaysia relations, and we talked about China as we, we talked about China as well. So. Uh, Japanese initiatives such as partnership for quality infrastructure is interpreted as more geopolitical than economic compared to past institutions or initiatives led by Japan. So given the intensification of rivalry between US and China and its effect on Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific, uh, do you think um, the, 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 the current situation or the, fut uh, the future pathway between relationship between Malaysia and Japan will be affected by the rivalry and how do you think is the solution? And the other thing is, we talked about Japan's different attitude and threat perception vis-a-vis -vis China than the Malaysia. So how would you comment on these uh, factors? Uh, thank you. Can I ask who, who you are directing your uh, question to? Uh, I am directing to Ambassador and also probably the guests who would like to contribute. Sure. I guess that's to all members of the panel then. Uh, does any, uh, who wants to go first? Um, 
I think in terms of US-China competition, we have to separate US-China competition from Malaysia-Japan relations. It is totally different, yeah? Because you're looking at the external, uh, whereas we're looking at the internal in terms of Malaysia-Japan relations. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I think Japan uh, sees uh, ASEAN centrality as an important uh, point uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, and Malaysia also. And Malaysia does not have its own Indo-Pacific strategy, which means that it adheres to ASEAN uh, Indo-Pacific st uh, strategy. So, which also means, yeah, which also means that we do not choose sites. Uh, as a small country, we do not choose sites, right? Um, I think that is understood very well by all parties, including Japan. So that is why I say that the U.S.-China competition is uh, a different, um, how do I put it, um, a, a different uh, crisis altogether, which should not be, um, you know, spoken together with Malaysia-Japan relations. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I agree uh, with you that the uh, China-U.S. Uh, confrontation and uh, Japan-Malaysia relations are different in nature. And uh, also, Japan-Malaysia developed our service uh, by industrialization, and uh, also we have benefited from globalization. And the core element uh, of the international system that supported this type of development was rule of law, safety of navigation, free trade. All those values are supported by Japan and Malaysia. And rather, we need to work together to enhance this aspect of international order so that we can continue to benefit from globalization. So some people rather tend to put emphasis on the separation, but rather we are in a position to emphasize togetherness and the unity of the international community. And that's what Japan and Malaysia can do. That is another reason why we really put emphasis on partnership. Because if we can be prosperous, we can apply to the others, how come you can do like Japan, Malaysia did, of course, we, there are some geopolitical confrontations, but we are the country who have been navigating very well in this wild water. So that's what we really wish to continue doing with Malaysia. Uh, Ms. Kato? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, go to the next question. I do need you to raise your hand for us to see you. Yes, sir. I see you at the back there. Uh, please just introduce yourself and uh, let us know who your question is directed to. Yeah. Good morning. My name is uh, Suresh. I'm directing the questions to all, but especially uh, Ms. Akiko and Dr. Gita. <clears throat> so um, I'm coming from a company called LTT Global Communications. Um, we are the leading uh, digital learning platform. Um, we have got more than one billion curated content on our platform. Um, it's edu for you dot today. Bit of publicity. But more importantly, why I'm saying this is that on our platform, we have short and long courses from, uh, from among the 5,000 we have from the university of uh, various universities in Japan, Kyoto University, Tokyo, and all that. And a lot of it covers everything to do with Lukis policy and about uh, culture, corporate culture, and all of that. Coming to my question, um, between Japan and um, Malaysia, everything that you all have spoken about the, at the core, it's got to do with education. Whether it's hard, core, hard subjects or soft subjects. Hard subjects means science, technology, engineering, maths, uh, coding, etc., 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 innovation, all of that. And it comes to soft, that's when Dr. Gita has mentioned, Ms. Akiko has mentioned all about um, values, work ethics, corporate culture, blah, 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 all of that. And Dr. Kita said perfectly well, Malaysian universities focus on learning Japanese language, but you forgot all the other things, yeah, that we had mentioned, hard subjects and so forth. So in the last 40 years, uh, thank you, Ms. Akiko, for the autograph just now. In the last 40 years, have we ever learned all of this, all about the hard subjects, 
all about the soft into malaysia if not what is the stumbling block in making that a reality rather than just studying japanese language thank you sounds like a very hardcore education question uh, dr gita maybe you want to take this first and then ms kat yeah i'll try um uh, as was mentioned before there are 26000 uh, students and trainees that have uh, had their education in japan and i'm very sure that they have uh, uh, you know they practice uh, uh, this values this ethics yeah uh, but in the uh, scheme of things what is 26000 uh, students compared to the population of malaysia how do you spread uh, those values that is the main question so as you said education is important but when we talk about education uh, we should start from kindergarten right so at this point in time there has to be um, a restructuring of our education system so i don't know how that's going to happen whether there is even a plan forward to restructure the education because values are very important uh, as tun says the values is the one that would Uh, good values will increase productivity which then will develop the country right so you have uh, um, uh, practitioners of those values but the fact that it has not spread out to the community that is the question why has what is the stumbling block i think not, uh, not many people have had the opportunity to study these values yeah uh, and um, uh, Yeah, that, that, that's why I would like to propagate that we need to have more uh, such programs like what we have in my department. Uh, in all, because uh, there are students who are very interested in Japan, but the outlet is not there for them because it's, uh, there are more students interested in Japan than scholarships available. Yeah? So, uh, so the fact that Tsukuba University uh, will be or might be um, you know, established here, we don't know, sorry. Uh, I don't know what the problems are. Uh, so th that is a starting point. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I totally agree that uh, to start from a a kindergarten or nursery school is uh, very important. Um, when Tun became the... Uh, Prime Minister the second time, I brought Tun uh, to one of uh, private elementary school in Kyoto. Maybe he, he, he has been uh, mentioning about tea ceremony because I showed at that time that uh, uh, <coughs> the students was uh, making uh, tea cups. Uh, ceramic cups, uh, pottery. And then after making the pottery, they invite their parents to have tea ceremony to say thank you to them before graduation of uh, uh, grade six. So, uh, and then the opposite corridor of the elementary school, uh, they teach uh, robotic. Uh, making robots and uh, IT uh, education and so forth and so on. So we need both sides of education. And he was very much impressed and he wanted to bring uh, element nursery or elementary school to Malaysia. However, unfortunately, he stepped down, so it didn't come true. Um, that is one of the things. But also, I think in this 21st century, we are not talking about 40 years ago, right? So we can use the device. Uh, in my uh, Asia Kakehashi project as, uh, uh, from 20 different countries, uh, 200 students come uh, to Japan for one year program. But it is only these 200 students, but Um, they have, uh, they have uh, made YouTube uh, how to wear mask, how to, how to uh, uh, wash hands during COVID-19 with their own language. And then they send it to their own school, they send it to the region, to the country, and everybody was watching that, and which made a very good 
uh, educational sort of a program. So I think we should really uh, use the IT technology um, for LEP education as well. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kato. I'm afraid I can't take any more questions. I was told by the organizers not to take questions uh, because we have to break for lunch and I think Tun is patiently waiting there for us. Uh, but I will turn over the floor to uh, his, uh, the ambassador. I believe you have one or two comments to make before we wrap this up, so please. Yeah, th th thank you very much. Yeah, uh, concerning this uh, education issue, uh, I, I want to make two comments. One is uh, when uh, in introducing the elementary school education uh, outside Japan, one of the good examples is Egypt. A president came to Japan and they were very much impressed how the elementary school children were trained. So he decided to build a Japanese style elementary school all over Egypt. Now they established more than 30 elementary school with Japanese principal in each, uh, each school. And they pro even provided a Japanese Arabic interpreter to each principal uh, to offer education. So this is one of the serious way to introduce elementary school education under the strong leadership of the president. I don't know if Malaysia wants to do the same, but this is one of the examples. And another thing, as a lot of people talk about scuba, I need to mention a little bit about scuba. Uh, the reason why it takes some time is how to bridge the gap between the legal system of Japan and the legal system of Malaysia. In particular, education is a very important issue for each country, so they have the different legal system. But once we overcome the issue, or we are already overcoming the issue, uh, the nearest possible timing will be sometime uh, 2024. Let's hope it will be materialized. And if it happens, this will be the first case Japanese university have branched outside Japan. So Malaysia is the first example. And I think it will open the new horizon to offer Japanese-style higher education to the other people. And I really want to make another success story in Malaysia. And I hope my term will continue until Tsukuba University opened in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are ending on a high note, and I think Dr. Gita wants to top that. Do you? No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We, we are ending on a high note. Uh, before I turn it over to Haris, uh, you know, if we do follow the Egyptian example, we definitely should not budget for Japanese to buy some Laiyu translators because Malaysians will just reply in English, as Thun uh, articulated just now. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Please uh, show our appreciation to our three speakers, and I turn it over to Haris. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The event today is coming to a close. On behalf of ISIS Malaysia, we would like to thank you for your participation today. We seek your feedback of the event by completing the survey forms provided, and you may return the field survey to any member of our team. We would like to invite everyone for lunch at the Red Restaurant on Level 2. Thank you, and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>